And good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure for me to be uh, with you today. And um, my name is Florencia Quesada. I am a researcher at the University of Helsinki, and I'm a co-organizer of the, of the International Symposium, Cities of Inclusion, Spaces of Justice. As I said, it's my pleasure and great honor to introduce uh, our distinguished uh, first keynote speaker, Professor Diane Davis. Professor Davis is a Charles Dyer Norton Professor of Regional Planning and Urbanism in, and Chair of the Department of Urban Planning and Design at Harvard's Graduate School of Design. She has been trained as a sociologist. Her research interests include the relations between urbanization and national development, comparative urban governance, socio-spatial practice in conflict cities, urban violence, and new territorial manifestations of sovereignty, especially in cities of the Global South. Her current research explores these themes through a focus on transport policy innovations and their impacts on urban sustainability. Her remarkable uh, publication record includes more than 180 publications in leading academic journals and books. Her really, uh, one of her most influential books, Urban Leviathan, actually the first one I've read about her, about Mexico City in the 20th century, traces the evolution of urban administration in Mexico City from the Mexican Revolution to the late 1980s. Through a historical analysis of Mexico City, she examines how the political struggle between local and national actors has driven Mexico City concentrated city concentrated urban growth. Further, her book, Discipline and Development, Middle Classes and Prosperity in East Asia and Latin America, by Cambridge University Press in 2004, published, it was named in 2005 the best book in political sociology by the American Sociological Association. She also co-edited Irregular Armed Forces and Their Role in Politics and State Formation, by Cambridge University Press in 2003, and Cities and Sovereignty, Identity Conflicts in the Urban Realm in 2011. And her latest uh, uh, co-edited publication is Transforming Urban Transport, Transport. She has also been awarded prestigious research fellowships from the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, the Ford Foundation, the Social Science Research Council, the United States Institute for Peace, and the Andrew Mellon Foundation, to name just a few. She is the founder and curator of the Mexican Cities Initiative at Harvard's Graduate School of Design, which is an emerging platform for experimental ideas and knowledge to help guide the transformation of Mexico's complex urban landscapes over the coming uh, decades. Professor Davis has also coordinated a large-scale project entitled Urban Resilience in Conditions of Chronic Violence, which examines the coping and adapting strategies adopted by citizens and authorities to push back against violence in seven cities around the world. She has received numerous awards. The latest, I cannot go through all of them because there are too many, so uh, the latest one being the Remarkable Woman in Transportation Award, uh, she has been named as one of the top 50 women in transport worldwide by the German Development Agency, Transforming Urban Mobility Initiative in 2019. The title of her lecture today, which is in the core of the topics that we are going to be discussing in these next two days in our symposium, it's entitled City, Nation, Network, Shifting Territoriality, Territorialities of Sovereignty, and urban violence in the Global South. Please join me in welcoming Diane Davis. Gracias. Good morning, everybody. That was a super long introduction. Thank you so much, Florencia. I just goes to show you, if you've, been a, if you've been around long enough, you accumulate writings and things like that. Um, I'm very excited to be here. I want to thank Florencia, Anya, and all the organizers of the conference. Um, what's a great pleasure, it's my first time in Helsinki, and I'm, I'm very 
um, much looking forward to finding out a little more about this amazing city. But another great thing about being here is I get a chance to meet some old friends, including people that I knew back when I first started teaching at the New School for Social Research. Mauricio and other people are here as well as others that I've been running into for the last several years. I meet some new urbanists who are interested in, in very much the same sets of questions that I'm interested in. Let me move this. Um, let's see. Uh, I just want to say that I really value this invitation because of the significance of the themes that you're, that you're focusing on. Um, I've been drawn to the description of the agenda that you established, which is to develop and discuss new approaches and epistemologies for understanding the insecurities, vulnerabilities, segregations, and exclusions characteristic of urban spaces. As I understand it, the overall aim of the symposium is also to produce norm normative actions or conversations about what to do to make cities more just and inclusive. Now that's a, quite a tall order, especially in today's world, and there are so many dimensions we're going to be looking at today, obviously climate change and forms of environmental insecurity uh, and vulnerability. I myself am going to be focusing a little more on uh, violence, but maybe in the next few days we're going to be able to link those things together because, of course, the question of climate refugees is not unrelated to the problems of, of violence. But I'm focusing particularly on questions of violence, which for many of us who study these, the Global South is an increasingly tragic problem that affects cities and citizens all around the world. I've written about, um, in my, Florence you mentioned that I'm trained as an urban sociologist, but I've been trafficking with urban planners for the last two decades, more or less, which has really helped pull me down from just critique and understanding the nature of problems to try to think a little bit more about solutions to problems. I, um, but I'm constantly stuck in, in a kind of a liminal space where I see urban policies as being responsible for the problems of violence and spatial exclusion, yet I want to engage with our students and my colleagues about how can we think about interventions that might solve the problem. Um, I also want to say that the, looking at the agenda, uh, I see that in the panels that are going to be unfolding, not just the other um, exceptional keynote speakers, but the whole group of people in the sub-panels, that we have some of the world's experts on questions of violence and, and kind of urban policy and how it unfolds at the scale of the city, particularly through planning practices and how they spatially exclude and marginalize the poor and vulnerable. So what I want to do today is rather than focusing on the grounded urban policy dynamics, which I know we will hear more about from some of our colleagues here, I'm going to turn my attention in my keynote to more to the epistemological challenges offered by the framers of this conference. In so doing, I want to discuss the problems of violence through the conceptual lens of sovereignty. I really hate looking at this paper because I can't even look at everybody in the audience, so let me try it this way. Um, and I want to tell you, share with you my thoughts about the interrelationship between sovereignty and violence and how it's unfolded historically. And in that sense, I want to offer a new way of theorizing and empiricizing urban violence paraphrase my good friend and departmental colleague, Neil Brenner, I want to revisit the concepts. Actually, he says categories. This is in one of his discussions about rethinking the urban. But I want to revisit the concepts, methods, and cartographies through which the urban could be understood. But again, in my case, through which urban violence can be understood. I've titled my talk with a focus on the city, nation, and network because I think those are the three cartographies that compete and overlap in terms of power dynamics in ways that drive urban violence. And I hope this will be clear over the course of my remarks. Some of you may be familiar, actually probably all of you familiar, are wedded to the concept of the state rather than sovereignty, or at least the national state, when talking about competing power dynamics. 
Sometimes people use the concept of sovereignty interchangeably with the notion of the nation state. But I see the concept of sovereignty as analytically distinct and as a much more robust entry point for understanding some of the major transformations and challenges of urban violence in the global south. So let me just say, lay on the table the definition of the concept of sovereignty that I'm going to be using, or at least arriving at, well, let's see, in this talk. Now, I found the concept of sovereignty to be less bureaucratically state-centric and thus better able to capture the range of cultural, economic, social, political, and even spatial practices that will comprise the governance regimes that characterize cities in the developing world, with these governance regimes unfolding both smaller and larger than the city and even the nation. All this is to say that, for me, the concept of sovereignty places primordial attention on territory, which is an invitation to introduce an understanding of the control of physical space and its relationship to social and political power and governing authority and to connect these dynamics to the problems of violence. With the concept of sovereignty, urbanists can move beyond the Weberian preoccupation with and definition of states as monopolizing the means of coercion within a given national territory and focus instead directly on the variety of territorial skills in which both the state and non-state actors try to monopolize the means of coercion. Let's not forget that in many contexts, particularly in, in the Global South and Latin America, where I work, where states tend to be weak and rule of law is not always well institutionalized, quotidian struggles to establish authority over territory are constant and ongoing. And they occur at scales as small as the street or the neighborhood, yet also on transnational and through transnational networks and unfolding at all scales in between the, the very local micro-urban, sub-urban, we might say, and the transnational. In this sense, sovereignty becomes a window into the studies of cities as much as states, not to mention their relationship to each other and how they produce violence. Now, I'm getting a little ahead of myself because I ultimately, at the end of my presentation, want to land on the concept of sovereignty more than start with it but I did want to let you know where, where conceptually I'm coming from. Now, how am I going to land on the notion of, of sovereignty? I want to do so by first turning to history, particularly the history of urban space, and to share with you my thoughts about the history of urbanization in Latin America and how that has led me to a preoccupation with both violence and sovereignty. Speaking of history, it, it goes without saying that the concept of sovereignty, no, where, where, where am I? Where am I? There. That the concept of sovereignty has its own history, and that history directly connects to the city and urbanization as much as the national state and national state formation, situating such dynamics in the medieval and early modern period. This notion, this idea, has been well established by scholars like Max Weber and Charles Tilley, whom Morrissey and I both worked with when we were at the New School, among many others. Um, actually, there's a new book out on urban citizens and sovereignty by Martin Prock that, in a way, kind of revisits this history of the relationship between citizenship, sovereignty, and, and urbanization in, across this, this part of the world. But I'm going to leave aside some of these kind of larger medievally oriented um, studies for a moment as I begin to drill down on the 20th history of centuries in Latin America, using the case of Mexico to make the argument about urbanization in late industrializers that will hopefully transfer to our discussion here today. To set the stage, in Mexico, a country I've studied for basically 25 years, if not longer, uh, the level of violence in the last decade and several and, and continuing even now with a new president that's interested in kind of trying to kind of control the problems of violence, as do every president that get elected in Mexico in the last decade or so. But in the last several years, we've seen levels of violence in Mexico that have matched those of 
places with all-out war, including Iraq and, and Gaf- Afghanistan. In certain locations, of which the Mexican border city of Ciudad Juarez is often the most notorious, violence levels are so high that local officials have called in the UN for peacekeeping forces to the city, using both the nomenclature and a mechanism historically created for dealing with wartime conflict at the scale of the nation. But I need not tell anyone here that violence is not specifically a border problem, nor is it specific only to many of the poor neighborhoods where we see the ravages of violence in Latin America. But historically, I would say it, violence and urban violence has tended to flourish in the most more marginalized areas of the city, often in informal settlements where a history of squatter occupations, ambiguous property rights, and lack of services characterize daily life. Citizens in the most neglected areas of the city have been left to reproduce their own shelter and livelihoods, which in a way is a form of sovereignty if you think about it. And to do so, they often turn to illicit actors and activities to guarantee the services, resources, and protection that local planning and policy authorities have failed to provide. The state, however, is likely to openly tolerate these practices, informality, and other forms of servancy servicing, or at least until recently, with your resurgence of support for neoliberal property rights regimes. And governments do so because it helps them achieve legitimacy in the absence of sufficient planning and efficient or sufficient distribution of services or adequate employment informality, etc. The toleration of informality has not only undermined the rule of law in ways that make violence and criminality more common, It's also meant that police, by virtue of their role as mediating powers in a political system where informal actors and activities are exploited by state actors for their own personal gain, have become, I'm talking about police here, become part of the problem of violence and insecurity. And maybe if there's time in the question and answer, I'm really eager to answer any queries about the history of police. I'm right now, my project during my sabbatical this year is I'm writing the history of police corruption in Mexico from the Mexican Revolution up to the present, which is the kind of the dark side, but like the thread that links together some of the other issues I'm speaking about today, which have to do with competing sovereignty and unrule of law, injustice, and violence. In many Latin American cities, the police have long been involved in extortion activities, and these practices have laid the foundation for their more contemporary networking with criminal elements. Even as they protect or engage with criminal elements, police also continue to abuse their power with respect to common citizens, whether because of the rent-seeking potential inherent to policing or just pure influence mongering. And again, Let's not forget that police obviously are the front line of the states, the national state's sovereignty and the city's sovereignty. In my mind, this suggests somewhat of a paradox. In situations of violence, one of the first lines of action undertaken by governing officials is to send in the police to restore order and aim in and of itself. Similarly, police are used to reestablish the state's provision and regulation of urban servicing, either directly or indirectly, in a bid to fulfill planning objectives and help generate citizen loyalty to the state. Um, And their indirect um, involvement in the kind of fulfilling the the, the objectives of the state is to break the power of local mafias or gangs who have cemented their authority through clandestine control of those urban services and other local governance functions. But my point here is either way, policing and security interventions are high on the priority of local officials, despite the fact that it's precisely the police who are most hated and the least legitimate arm of the government. Police have frequently been used to, as a means to eliminate the moral disorder of informal areas and ensure that the pathologies, again quotes, and activities of poor residents in informal areas do not spill over to the formal city, often reflecting in the bulldozing of informal settlements, for example, and other policies that um, police have an objective to kind of divide or restructure informality to make it more formal. My point here is that police intervention in poor communities, even when it's conceived by the local government as a frontline move to pave the way for better planning action later, 
is highly suspect and thus drives the cycle of mistrust and, and overrule of law as well as violence. And all this helps me make the case, the kind of my starting premise, that to a certain degree, both the origins and responses to urban and violence involve some sort of state ordering of territory, ranging from urban planning practices on one hand to revanchism and police segregation of the city on the other. So the question then, and what I'm gonna talk about for the next few minutes is how and why did this approach to the policing, planning, and spatial segregation of the city emerge? And that's where my history comes in. This is, of course, a huge topic to kind of understand why that approach to the city emerged, and it can't be covered completely in depth in the context of a short presentation, but I'm going to try to lay out some general principles about the history of urbanization and policy, the ideas that governed the growth of the city and how that ultimately led to violence, and then I'll end with some discussion of the city-nation network relationship. So, and I'm gonna tell the story through a series of like four or five claims. Um, that kind of lay in a path-dependent way the problems of urbanization that led to violence. So my first claim is that the root foundations of urban violence can be partly traced to the modernist planning distinction between the formal and the informal city. In the developing world, the actions of planners, both urban and national, were informed by the assumption that development occurred through the conquest and reshaping of untamed space in the service of social and spatial integration. On the national scale, this entailed a colonization, if you will, of national space through major infrastructural projects like roads and electricity, with the aim of integrating people, places, and natural resources into a larger project of employment and economic expansion. At the level of the city, architect planners and there were architects at that time, most of the planners, with a few engineers thrown in. Their programmatic concerns with rationalizing social and spatial order were manifest in the development of urban plans with a strict spatial order. Different parts of the city were not only preserved for different social and economic functions. I do wanna mention, this is Jose Luis Sert, who was one of the deans of the Graduate School of Design, where I now teach, came over from Spain too bring ideas of planning, which really emerge more in the European context to the American context. Now, different parts of the city were not only preserved for different social and economic functions, there was little room for any so-called pre-modern mixing of land uses or informal activities in those areas designated as sites for modern economic and political order. Such dictates redirected citizens to liminal and usually distant areas of the city where informality was tolerated for reasons I mentioned earlier and where marginality flourished. Even as planners responded by extending the modernist project to ever more populations and neighborhoods over time as fiscal capacity allowed, it was usually done through state investment in workers' housing, transport, and services. On the other hand, because we're talking about projects of modernization that occurred um, in tandem with efforts to expand the economy and industrialize, fiscal constraints usually meant that such goods could not be provided for all urban residents. One result was the development of a divided city in which large swaths, and by the way, I have some slides from multiple cities, but many of the focus slides are from Mexico City because this is a problem even though much of my work draws on the Mexican context. Almost all major Latin American cities had a group of modernist planners, including many from the town planning associates at the GSD, Corbusier himself, and others kind of working and giving ideas about how to plan their cities in the 50, 40s, between the 40s and the 60s. So, the the result of all this was the development of a divided city in which large swaths of the urban population lived in no man's lands, that they were often called, outside the social, spatial, and political bounds of the formal city. Whether seen as marginal or informal, planners' preoccupation with the trappings of modernity meant that residents of these neighborhoods were practically invisible to city 
officials and in a way purposely because they were outside the law and outside the places that were zoned for planning. So their invisibility meant that they were, there was a studied failure to recognize them as part of the modern project. And that further justified the, ex explo the exploitation of neighborhoods without services, as well as their, you know, kind of their pro proliferation, again, without formal property rights, lacking in political recognition, and with only minimal access to the goods and services of the modern or formal city. These patterns not only set the basis for social and spatial separation rather than integration, or they reinforce the views that those who lived at the formal city marginal neighborhoods were second-class citizens, not morally worthy of inclusion or recognition, whose urban lifestyles and practices both stained, that's probably a word that they would have used, and challenged the larger modernist project. Planning officials' failure to formally recognize the social and economic value of the ad hoc practices undertaken by residents in informal settlements, as, also, as well as their unwillingness to, embr to embrace these or other alternative forms of urbanism as either a legitimate or justifiable response to hardship, led to reprisals and at times flat-out destruction of entire neighborhoods. We had a mayor in Mexico City called the bulldozer mayor. For who was known for just like going down, every time Sunday we'd set up a settlement, they, they would be bulldozed. But even without actual bulldozing, the threat of displacement fueled community instability and new forms of clientelism that constituted a form of political dependence on informal community leaders. In addition to calling into question the strong horizontal na networks among community residents, and that those were usually developed in the process of settling informally. You needed your neighbors to bring your, your tables and your, the wood to build your house and to kind of tap your water, etc. So th there was strong horizontal connections. But the, the development of, of leaders in the community to mediate the relationship between the citizens and the state often broke down those horizontal uh, uh, network. So in addition to calling to question the strong horizontal networks among co community residents, these factors, as well as the kind of growth of individual leaders in these neighborhoods, reinforced vertical networks of authority, whether formal or informal, built around the power of those who could protect and or accommodate residents in those marginal areas. In other words, protect them, maybe make a deal with the police or the mayor not to send in the bulldozers. The end result was the emergence of an array of informal and illicit leaders, governance leaders, who guaranteed or grounded their legitimacy and reinforced their authority by controlling informal territories and activities within them for their own personal gain. Whether through direct protection of citizens and physical territory or through co-optation and extortion, these leaders, local leaders, their own extortion as well as in the extortion networks with police, built their power by offering an alternative form of sovereignty that paradoxically further limited the power and capacity of the formal state or the formal sovereign to integrate these spaces of informal urbanism into the plans and projects associated with the rest of the city. So the point here I think I, I want to underscore is that it's not just merely planners' ideas of formal versus informal, but there, then there were adaptations, local, social, political adaptations and responses that are part of the path dependency of leading down the path towards different sovereignties and violence. My, my next claim is that the preoccupation with and privileging of physical planning over social and economic planning, and that was part of the modernist agenda, both as a general trend within modernist paradigms and its application to informal settlements in particular. And again, it was only, I mean, at best, in many decades in the 60s and 70s, you got the state to think about housing. That was basically about it. It wasn't about jobs. Um, that created an environment where employment and livelihood prospects depended on and were brokered by the physical environment. As planners sought to build the modern city, they concentrated attention on infrastructure and services, leaving questions of jobs and employment to the market. This was particularly the case with the array of physical interventions that were intended to lay the foundation for citizens' entry into the world of work. <laughs> 
by providing shelter for the new laboring classes coming from the countryside and are building roads that can facilitate urban labor mobility. This actually is Mario Pani's uh, project for Tlaloco. These were state workers. So those people that did get modernist housing and there there were modernist housing projects all over Latin America tended to be a very small category of working people that were either employed by the state or employed in factories in a relationship between factory, industrial, the industrial classes and the state. And although planning interventions prioritized the formal city, so and then these were put in the formal city and became part of the formal city, a similar logic also dominated the infrastructural development in informal areas where priority was given to housing in order to ensure often formal property rights as well as transport. Concerns about what type of employment opportunities would be offered in informal areas were almost completely absent, including efforts to develop and foster a thriving commercial sector in those locations, mainly because commercial activities and growth were considered to be principal activities for downtown areas and other well-differentiated zones in the formal city. In other words, even though the economy of informal areas was thriving commercially, it was never on the agenda of kind of commercial economic development and from the perspective of planners. This meant, um, let's see, uh, this meant that even when informal areas received infrastructural investments that paralleled or linked them to the formal cities, the local economies of those settlements remained highly underinvested, at least in terms of state programs and policies, which then laid the foundation for continued poverty. So when the investments, like I said, were housing and possibly transport. In this environment, the government's failure to, employ, to achieve full employment goals for the working poor, coupled with the fact that social services associated with the welfare state tended to be offered primarily to those involved in the formal sector, uh, often mediated by the demands from organized labor, which was an achievement, so I don't want to underscore that, but it was for a very small percentage of the population. This meant for th- that for those living in formal settlements that built environmental and physical infrastructure of their neighborhoods became the site of self-employment and economic production. This was best seen in the buying and selling of access to physical services like electricity, water, uh, other... M- gas, etc., as a means of reproduction. Paradoxically, then, given the studied and purposeful neglect of informal areas, it was the un- and underemployed poor residents of informal neighborhoods who actually were in the best position to use built environmental assets as a source of reproducing or gaining their economic livelihoods. But because these activities and exchanges were always conducted outside the law, these same and often with mafia leadership these same practices reinforced and strengthened the illegal market for urban services, thus laying the foundation for the emergence of illicit and illegal actors and networks and upping the scale for those who had the political power to protect them. To the extent that informal political leaders based their local legitimacy on their capacities to provide uh, cover for illegal or illicit markets, or when they were involved with them and took rent from them as well, both residents and formal leaders needed each other, further tying them to each other in alternative reciprocities that distanced them from the formal city and from the rule of law and the formal state. And in the context of these foundational elements, I have argued violence began to flower. The u- claim three, the use of built environmental assets and in informal exchanges for reproduction produced new forms of political power, creating divisions within the state's development bureaucracy and, empowers- and empowering illicit actors at the local level who cemented their authority through their capacity to mediate within and between citizens and the state. The policy distinction between, the physical, between physical and economic domains or between reproduction and production also mapped onto the bureaucratic structures of the state in ways that fragmented political authority and urban governance in and over informal areas. To the extent that city authorities, took, city, so bureaucrat, bureaucracies within the state took care of physical planning issues while national authorities adopted the social and economic planning initiatives, jobs, etc., and the police were in between working not for planning but like mediating these things in their relationship 
uh, with informal settlements, not only was there fragmentation, there was little coordination between the programs and priorities of the formal state. Local authorities may have struggled for the development of housing, but without control over employment or macroeconomic policies, they weren't in a position to ensure that residents had the income potential to afford home ownership. That's why you have all the self-help housing programs by John Turner and others that were developed in the aftermath of the kind of rise in informality. Um, so the, the residents didn't have the capacity to buy into a formal homeownership citizen that the state was, was promoting, and nor were city finances, finances sufficient to pick up the slack by offering full subsidies to the under underemployed. This led to an array of projects and arrangements, and as I mentioned earlier, including sites and services, squatter upgrading, land regulation, regularization promoted by the multilaterals as well as local governments that served only a fraction of the population and that when implemented tended to fragment informal settlements into multiple, I'm using the concept of, that Peter Saunders developed, housing classes. Imposition of property rights, and this is the famous Torre David, you know, which was abandoned and re-squatted, a huge modernist project that is now like totally illicit and under informal rule, even before Venezuela started like falling off the map. Imposition of property rights with a view to larger social or economic consequences of home ownership or its large impact on solidarity within the community. Remember the horizontal social relationships that develop out of informality as opposed to kind of the ways in which formal property ownership um, fragments community connections and creates individual consumers, owners of their own property. All this led to further social divisions with the community between those with and without title. It pushed those without title to become more dependent on the local power brokers, even as those with title became more linked to formal governing institutions but both served as forms of patronage that sustained informal and formal political authority as two kind of separate networks. Such developments undermined horizontal relationships as I mentioned earlier. The existence of multiple housing classes itself built on the uneven patterns of land tenure and property rights further empowered those who wielded the capacity to mediate these mafia, local neighborhood mafia, between the formal and informal systems of service provision, as well as between licit and illicit activities. And I mentioned earlier that this is not just mafias, but also the police involvement in formal neighborhoods. Now, the police were initially involved in order to control populations in space, as well as to impose spatial order. But like over time, the robustness of this set of informal networks and the split between the formal and informal ultimately pulled police directly into the, those networks. Um, and once they were kind of involved in the negotiation and the bargain, police tended to accommodate and reinforce the informal order, but of course that meant that they were also tied into the illicit activities that provided the sources of livelihood in the uh, informal sectors. In these low-income communities, and this is something I'm looking at in my, in my study of policing, but the, there are kind of clear market prices for extortion. And it was so great that often police and informal leaders ended up competing with each other over who would control local protection rackets over time. And this led to longstanding networks, not only between police and local leaders, but it also often brought violence between them because they were struggling to control those networks of rent seeking in the informal neighborhood. In those environments where police protected criminals more than residents and where the scale of illicit trade expanded beyond the community's boundaries, violence was much more likely to be the currency of order from both, both the local residents as well as the police. And again, this occurred not just because police complicity in illegal activities meant the rule of law was all but non-existent or because such an environment produced high resident mistrust of police um, it was also because informal authorities were constantly struggling to control social and spatial dynamics, and that often involved violence with the police. The more the networks of protection, extortion, and trade spread beyond the community over time, again, because if everybody is struggling to control these nodes of kind of illicit activities that emanate from many of these neighborhoods, over time, there was a need to kind of move your network of extortion and activities beyond the neighborhood itself. 
Uh, so the more these networks extended in space, the greater the sums of money exchanged and the more diffuse the networks have exchanged. And this in turn provided a range of new opportunities for rent seeking because the territorial expansion of the networks was changing, which um, drove violence as a mean of asserting authority. So this is where I kind of try to end up at sovereignty. And my fourth claim, the combined effect of these developments, and I, I'm already repeating, so I'm not going to say them again, basically created new forms of loyalty and allegiance at the level of the neighborhood, first of all, that later extend in space. And I want to think about these allegiances through the conceptual lens of sovereignty. After all, these loyalties both built on and derived from connections among those whose livelihoods were socially and spatially linked to informal governance, and I want to underscore the word governance, and illicit activities like their alternative rules of law, so to speak, at both the subnational level and ultimately, which I'll end up in a second, the transnational level. To the extent that these alternative kind of communities of allegiance and reciprocity provided new forms of welfare meaning, they often operated as a functional equivalent of states, thereby sustaining new forms of what I call non-state sovereignty that contrast to the imagined national communities of sovereignty that sustained modern national state formation and traditional patterns in sovereignty. And this is kind of along the lines of the concept articulated, as you see I'm using already, by Benedict Anderson on imagined communities. Benedict Anderson, the great theorist of modern national state formation in his book through looking at the print media and how that created um, imagined communities of reciprocity at the national level. I'm really interested in bringing that concept of imagined communities, alternative loyalties, down to the neighborhood, then to the city, and then we're going to move out later. When these new imagined communities existed apart from, if not in opposition to traditional national states, they often chose or are forced to rely on their own armed actors to sustain, nurture, or protect their activities and dominion, especially when they conflict with national state requisites. So here, you know, again, the Weber and... and Tilly-esque idea of the monopolization of the means of coercion as a, f as a part of the characteristic of modern national state formation, we have to start looking at the monopolization of the means of coercion, co coercion at a very small scale first, because that's also part of not just the cultural side, the imagined community, but kind of the sovereignty and the authority to kind of connect those two things together. In many cities of Latin America today, even the traditional policing coercive function of the state is now undertaken by informal actors like mafias or private security forces, no longer the public police, but the private police, and it's often public police that are moonlighting as private police and private security forces at night, whose allegiance rests only with their clients, not with the state. And this, so that creates this kind of Wild West type of atmosphere uh, where whoever has the rule of gun, of the gun, or the kind of the gun, the pocket, in a way, is kind of sovereign over his territory and his rights, or her rights. In this Wild West type of atmosphere, low-income communities with a history of informality find themselves in a situation where violence is a principal currency for greasing the wheels of economic growth and wielding political power. In the best of circumstances, these local authorities are well enough connected to the community, the political system, and the rule of law to both protect and engage the citizenry in the face of growing violence, while also supplanting the legitimate power of the nation. And this, I would say, is a story in the, in the case that I've looked at in Mexico. There are many decades where this system kind of worked, the coexistence of these alternative ways of, of you know, solving problems, not servicing poor people, letting them have their own, their own alternative sovereignty, so to speak. But owing to the histories and the decades of state neglect, social and spatial inclusion, police impunity, and the kind of buying into this informal assistance of govern governance, violence flourished and intensified. And it's just gotten worse and worse and worse. And I started studying violence in the 90s which is the time that Mexico liberalized their economy and their political system, trying to move away from one-party rule in the mid-90s. 
right after the signing of the NAFTA, this is exactly the moment when violence grows out of control. In other words, so that the kind of the system coexisted for a certain, for a set of decades, and then at one point it no longer created kind of order with like violence on the margins. Violence became everyday currency of life. If this happens, and when this happens, citizens' connection to the idea of the state, so the territory, allegiance, rule of law, and police, is broken in fundamental ways. And it's hard to go back. And it limits both the local and national state's capacity to use any policy planning or policing tools to actually serve the population or kind of put the violence back into the Pandora's box that's been opened or, let's say, constructed over decades and then opened when violence reached a tipping point. My last claim, I think. The advent of globalization and neoliberalization has extended networks of violence into new territories, creating illiberal as well as liberal economies of transnational trade that further undermine national state hegemony and drive competition between different sovereigns, thus fueling violence in ways that link local nodes of contention to global activities. And this is where I want to say it's decades of kind of intensification of violence that kind of disrupt the kind of coexistence between these two kind of competing imagined communities, these two kind of forms of sovereignty, formal, national, informal, local, but ultimately with violence and the activities of trade and extortion and illegalities extending over territory, not only first over the city, but then over the nation. You, this is exactly where there is no return back to control of violence. And this is just an example of the competing sovereignties and territorialities that we can see of drug trafficking. And I'm not going to go into this now, but I've written a little bit more about how activities that used to be just kind of illicit trading of informal goods, for example, the smuggling in of washing machines from the United States when there were trade and protection barriers, totally was upended with the liberalization, with NAFTA and the liberalization of the economy. So as the global, global economic globalism changed and national protectionisms kind of were eliminated, you start seeing these actors actors who are involved in the smuggling and illicit activities that were just like petty, uh, import petty trade and in some ways importation of goods that were protected from other places move into drugs and guns. And that, in a way, is built on those networks that were created in the 50s, 60s, and 70s over just everyday illicit activities. So what I've been describing so far are the historical dynamics of modernist pl urban planning, their spatial impacts. Um, but I want to wrap up the story by bringing it to the present, and that's why I have this, and I have one more slide, by discussing the ways that violence has accelerated and become harder to control in the face of the newest iteration of modernization, economic globalization, and neoliberalization. So um, the economic globalization has expanded commodity trade beyond national borders. I already said that. I'm going to keep on going for forward. So, And I guess I want to say that this leads me to my where I started in the focus on city nation network, because I do want to start wrapping up. So bringing us full circle analytically speaking. So I want to say that the transnationalization, so first that other slide was just the national networks and the competing territorialities. This is a global map of kind of drug trade and illicit trafficking which is part of the kind of huge problem that at least Mexico, many other countries face it, maybe not Colombia of course, but maybe not to the same degree. The almost complete breakdown of the national state's leg legitimacy with respect to producing social order uh, has happened as economic globalization is moving these networks, these, uh, these alternative imagined communities to kind of extend their sovereignty over the globe. And this is re re reproducing a crisis of democracy, obviously, in countries that are facing these problems of violence and where their kind of violence networks are extended on a global scale. And I would say, you know, again, in trying to close up, that this is kind of what's happening in Mexico today. I can wait for the Q&A or we can talk about it later, but I'm really struck by the fact that our, the new president in Mexico, Andres Manuel López Obrador, a left populist that came hugely popular, came into power with like two agendas, well, actually three 
relevant agendas for, for this talk. The first is um, kind of protectionism. The second is decentralization. So kind of building up, uh, investing in these marginalized areas all over the nation as well as in cities that have been ignored and eliminating the problems of violence. And he's created a new alternative police force to deal with it. Uh, I won't say now about uh, what's happening with that. There's not any headway so far with violence. Of course, it's a long problem, almost impossible to solve. But um, violence has gone up in Mexico since he be became since he was elected, and some of that may again be like the bite back of the drug traffickers because now they have a state that's not complicit with them, that wants to undermine them, and we're in for another round of battle and violence. So let me wrap up a little. Um, uh, I want to turn to the question of what is to be done. So it goes without saying that planners are going to be hamstrung in their efforts to deal with the problems of chronic violence, if only because the legit legitimacy of planners owes in no part to both rotten paradigms or bad paradigms like modernism, but also to the power and the nature of the sovereigns or the authorities on whose behalf they are planning and intervening. So in that sense, planning theorists and urban practitioners have to be cognizant of their own limitations and will have to work with citizens themselves I mean, with citizens and others at a very local scale whose efforts to wrench control of local territories as, is a condition, as a necessary condition to move away from the perpetration of violence uh, that, that kind of starts locally and moves at other scales. Having said this, a focus only on a single node or a territorial scale will not readily undermine or challenge a set of activities that unfolds across networks and territories beyond that node. But pessimism and hopelessness is not going to solve the problem either, though I know we're talking about climate change in this conference, so I mean, maybe I, I don't know what the balance of pessimism and hopelessness is going to be after two days, but here with the violence, and I'm starting us out, I'm, I'm, I have to say I'm quite pessimistic, but I do have a, I've tried hard in loyalty to my discipline, my current discipline applying to think a little more about what kind of, is there anything that can be done at the margins that at least um, maybe break down the lock on the, of this, this terrible, intractable problem. So first and foremost, um, oh, I guess that's, that's the pessimism on me right there. <laughs> uh, first and foremost, planners and activists could do well to turn their attention to recasting the scales and sovereignties of planning action. So planners have to start thinking about sovereignty and to, um, to build synergies rather than greater division between these fragmented and completing sovereigns or completing, uh, competing territories of the city. Now, planners will be hamstrung by the larger ideological projects that they frame their authority, I understand that. But either way, if peace and coexistence that can chart an exit from vicious cycles of violence is the aim, then one has to imagine new forms of planning action that think about sovereignty and that link competing territorialities. And for me, I have this, this, this I, I put up this uh, sketch by Sert because Sert wrote this amazing book in the 60s called Can City Survive? He was really worried in, in the context of the modernist planning paradigm whether they were doing the right thing and whether cities were gonna be able to survive. He had no clue what the cities, this is I think Bogota, what the cities that he's been studying and planning for are like, what are the questions of survival in the contemporary era? So. Three things in the context of that larger planners think about sovereignty and space differently. So f first would be, I would say, a purposeful rethinking of the formal, informal divide in planning practices with an eye to understanding how alternative urbanisms that are practiced by excluded populations can serve as a basis, not just for strengthening their own neighborhoods, but for challenging their inferior status and for casting, recasting an evaluation of areas in the city in light of their ability to embrace alternative urbanisms. Now, this is obviously the kind of poster child of optimism that's glowing around the world. Everyone is looking at Medellin, and we know there's a very dark side to what's happening in Medellin, but I'm looking for kind of positive ex examples, and I like the idea of recognition and inclusion and the fact that an alternative 
ways of living, including informality, need to be celebrated. And bringing the library, Biblioteca de España, to this part of the neighborhood was part and parcel of rethinking about alternative urbanisms. The second obvious for anybody who's in planning, but the development of new participatory strategies that empower residents, not just empower them to kind of talk to the formal state, but that empower their capacities to negotiate with and create autonomy from the agents of violence, both mafia actors in their neighborhood, as well as the police and other forms of the state is a kind of a second, you know, foundational change in, in kind of urbanism and planning. So kind of thinking about security strategies from below so the citizens are not forced to rely on state or market actors in reproducing their livelihoods. Um, and um, third, a territorial reordering of planning practices that will focus less attention on given localities alone as just like, let's just make sure there's housing and water and electricity and people can talk to each other at the neighborhood and more attention to creating networks of activities and allegiances that transcend the individual neighborhoods of the city. In other words, the networks of solidarity across poor neighborhoods, just the way illicit actors have their networks of solidarity across neighborhoods and across the globe. And this could actually be a global issue, how do we create networks of solidarity of the poorest of the poor who are facing violence every day in their local neighborhood and, and don't have the capacity to solve it on their own. Such an appeal stands in contrast to the conventional planning practice in contemporary democratic societies where the local community, and this is what decentralization and democratic decentralization has done, has made the locality the starting and ending point for participation and planning action. I, I just don't think that is going to do anything in the face of violence. It may bring people together to decide with participatory budgeting where a bus stop is going to be, but it's really not going to get to the root problems of kind of their spatial exclusion. Um, so I might conceptualize kind of the way that you build on locality but move, territorially move networks beyond that as a form of separation with connection that allows planners and citizens to work more to understand the array of infrastructural, social, and economic policies that support networks as opposed to su supporting a locality. So to conclude and summarize, to rethink overall spatial planning goals in ways that can take into account the servicing governance and economic relationship of the parts and the whole of the city and beyond to other relevant territories paying special attention to locations where violence and exclusion have prevented integration and justice, and thinking of new ways to achieve these synergies. In a globalizing world where neoliberal political and economic policies are ascendant, it's easy for citizens to become less connected to the nation as a primordial site for political allegiance and social and economic claim making, and more tied to their alternative imagined local communities where these excluded places where their loyalties are. But I think they need to be thinking territorially beyond the nation state and again, shifting from locality, maybe beyond the nation state with allegiances through networks to kind of a global activism to help empower them. When divisive economic or social projects that the state imposes are allowed to flower and fragment the urban domain, conflict is likely and the search for order becomes so urgent that it becomes tempting for the state to revert to modernist techniques of social and spatial control, but those are the ones that help fuel violence and conflict in the first place. So in the face of like the alternative, what we don't want, an alternative scaling of allegiances built around tangible planning action that connects the territorial parts in the whole while creating new social and spatial synergies between the enfranchised and the disenfranchised may be the best course of action. And that's where I'll end right there. Thank you. <laughs> Will we do questions or you, okay, okay. Thank you very much, Diane, for this inspiring uh, talk about the many complex uh, urban issues we faced in Latin America with this historical perspective and uh, all these new ideas to, to try to solve this, this if, if it's possible to solve such a complex problem. But now we are running a little bit out of time, so I won't talk more, but give you the floor for questions, please. For Diane, we have about uh, 10 minutes 
Five minutes, maybe. Five, <laughs> five minutes for questions, but please, uh, yep. Uh, hello, thanks for your and talk. And please introduce yourself. Uh, I am Nadia. I am a doctoral student here and a researcher at the University of Turku as well. And I just wanted to ask you your take on the new National Guard, Sorry. this new organization that the Lopez Obrador government has mm -hmm. uh, uh, encouraged, uh, which is, it, it gives me also a lot of pessimism, but What's your take on this new organ? Okay. Do you want me to go one on one, or do you want to um, pile a few? Yeah, I mean, well, I'm happy to answer that if they're. In... If maybe well, I can you start. Can I can answer, start. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, the if people know, so Lobos Alberta comes in and creates a new kind of armed force, which he's calling a national guard, that he has a little more authority and control over. So I, the I, I am. I'm of double mind about the national. Guard. I've talked, a lot of human rights people have criticized him immediately because everybody's piling on, the human rights world is piling on because everyone's afraid he's going to be the next Madero. So I, I don't think they're giving him the benefit of the doubt of some of the policies. And they've you know, piled onto him because National Guards means militarizing policing work on an everyday scale. Um, but in my work that I'm doing now on the history of police corruption, one of the things that I found is that every government in Mexico has realized that the police are out of control and they try to militarize local police in, in certain ways. And that is a part of the story of the, of the problem. So I am a little concerned about the militarization of everyday policing, although now he's made a deal with Trump and he's using them against Central American migrants. So uh, I, I'm of double mind about that. But let me just say, understand why he's doing it. And this gets to the rock and the hard place of the problem that um, he can't trust any of the other militarized forces because they're all linked to corruption lines. The military is totally linked to drug trafficking. The police are totally linked. So if you're coming in with a national, as a national state president, you have to kind of monopolize the means of coercion. You have to have some coercive, coercive force starting you. So he's creating his own force. And the question becomes whether that new alternative force will end up with competing and overlapping sovereignties and loyalties that drive the problem of violence or undermine it. So I think that he is going to have to be linking this National Guard to another spatial project. It can't just be enough to have yet another kind of free-floating bureaucratic institution of police floating around that is going to be fighting with the military and the drug traffickers, you know, and maybe colluding with them. Who knows? So Thank that's my you. view. Another question, please? No questions? No. So, yeah, please. <laughs> Very quick questions, please. Yeah. Uh, yes, so um, you uh, br brought in neoliberalism with these transnational networks, but what I know from other places in Asia that I study is that neoliberalism also uh, shapes the value of the city, so mm -hmm. new kinds of uh, developments become reality. And so informality is being challenged through that kind of new value system mm -hmm. when modernism let that be, uh, by, uh, but now uh, there are new kinds of threats because this land starts to be very valuable. So how does this work in your context? Mm -hmm. Um, well, the neoliberal, I mean, we're going to hear about that from Saskia, I think, later. She's the expert on these things. But I would say, from the Latin American perspective, that um, the neoliberal economic project, when it lands in cities, and uh, it's in Mexico City, the whole downtown is being transformed by Slim and other people. Um, I mean, millennials, we all love it, coffee houses, and there's, like, it's so nice to go down there. Yes, there's, the gentrification, there's gentrification that comes along with it. But to me, the big, largest problem is the property values, which kind of displace pe even people that who, there have been, at least in Mexico City, and every city in Latin America is different. But there have been pop pockets of informality. Many of, uh, many of these places where, where violence has followed in the city, it's not always in the periphery. So... Um, and that is actually a challenge for the police. I might explain a little bit of the complicity between the police because the form, um, some of the informality was embedded in the, info, 
in the formal city, it's not just the divide of the informality and the periphery. And what neoliberalism is going to do is push all those poor people out to the periphery, and that will create more spatial exclusion. Now, in a case of like Mexico, I've done, I did a three-year project for Infonavit, which is the National Workers' Housing Authority. The neoliberalization of social housing has basically killed the city and also created more spatial exclusion, and they've built private property, so it's formal property, rights given to people who have pensions to live out in the periphery. And it's so far from the city and so far from the project of the city and family networks, informal services, et cetera, that those projects are now being abandoned and drug traffickers are moving into those. So I would say that neoliberalization has exacerbated the problem in the Latin American cities that I've seen. It is not the resolution to the problem. Thank you very much. What? Case. Well, maybe the last question now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah please. Here. Yeah. yeah. Uh, sorry. Here first. Uh, no, I was first, actually. Ah, sorry. <laughs> yeah. uh, Herman Kimbayu, University of Eastern Finland, uh, doctoral researcher. I don't have questions. I have like uh, many issues uh, regard regarding this presentation. I'm from Colombia. I'm doing research in Bogota. And I would say that there is no such a thing of a unique Latin American experience. I mean, you cannot generalize. And it's important to bear in mind that uh, we cannot forget the state nation, the state nation formation, uh, because it's also part of these dispossession processes. I mean, it's, for instance, some of the elites in each country, and especially in Colombia, are driving this narrative of. Uh, of uh, justify this possession to this narrative that this is the good thing for Colombia, for instance. So we cannot forget, of course, the global processes are, are, are very present. But mm -hmm. my point is that you cannot generalize. And there are a lot of uh, urban experience in Latin America. I mean, we have too many layers, like a geographical and historical, like uh, the colonial city, the republican city, the modern mm -hmm. city, and even ecologies. We have the Andean cities. We have the Amazon cities. We mm -hmm. have Caribbean cities. So this is also like a... Uh, creating a lot of new uh, perspectives to take into account mm -hmm. that uh, there is this risk of to, uh, to oversimplify and also the violence. Of course, all these processes mm -hmm. are shaping this kind of violence mm -hmm. and yeah. also like a very nuanced. So that's Thank it, you very much. This is very interesting and I'm sure we're going to keep on discussing about this in, in our seminar, but unfortunately we're running out of time. And here just maybe the last question for uh, here. Yes. Sorry. And then they will, I will answer your question also in the two of them. Yeah, after I hear from yeah. Case, I will respond. And that will be the very last question. Uh, I'll, I'll be brief. Keep. Thank you, Florencia. Thank you, Diane, for your wonderful talk. Uh, I have a question. In fact, uh, we talk a lot about neoliberalism, but uh, are we not also moving towards a, a, a very ambivalent post-neoliberalism in which, on the one hand, mm -hmm. you see more room uh, for those more constructive, promising things that you mentioned and which mm -hmm. I found a very interesting perspective of bringing the beyond the formal informal divide and, and reintegrating initiatives mm -hmm. in cities. But at the same time, we also see that uh, uh, there is a new rise of a sort of punitive populism in a post neoliberal vein, eh, like Bolsonaro in Brazil, mm -hmm. uh, that also paradoxically mobilized a lot of support among the excluded, informalized urban mm -hmm. communities. So how would you look uh, at that? And uh, uh, mm -hmm. for instance, in the case of Lopez Obrador, or more mm -hmm. generally, and uh, do you share a concern about this, uh, Diane? Right. Great question. Well, both of them are related to an extent. I would say that you're asking a question about the specificity of a space, or you're pulling on the table, and Case is talking about specificity of time. And this was a very general discussion of like 40 years of history to try to kind of have a kind of draw a broad sketch of problems of violence, particularly Mexico, which I know best. And I know a little bit about Colombia, not to the same degree. So let me first say that the comment about the specificity of place, of course, all cities in Latin America are different. And they have different histories, they have different relationships to the nation state. Colombia itself has a div divided, still in civil war, no no period of national consolidation. So how violence ma in cities maps onto that national sovereignty project is different than in other places. So I totally agree with you. But I do want to say that 
I have, I, I've given, I've been working on violence for a long time and I have often been asked the question from uh, students and scholars at presentations who work on other parts of the so-called global south, South Asia, East Asia, and everybody wants to know well, why is violence so much worse in Latin America? So as much as there are variations across Latin America, I think it's worth thinking about the histories of state formation and economic development in Latin America. They have their own peculiar historical heritage. Some of that has to do with when they became independent. It's different than like the in Mumbai, there's violence, but violence in India is not violence. In, in Latin America, they have a problem of neoliberalization, displacement, segregation, exclusion, but they don't have the history of violence. That's one reason I'm doing this history of police corruption because I think there's something about the history of institutional development of states and state formation and where does the state work with military and police. There's something different over the last 100 years that it sets a foundation for 20th, and 21st century economic development that, so when liberalization lands, or even when industrialization lands, it's very different in Latin America. So I agree, and we can talk about it maybe, in, maybe over the next few days. About Case's question, it's a brilliant question. I'm gonna have to revise this now because, you know, I had to like bring Lopez Obrador into the picture. It was the pre dominating for so many years. But it's interesting you asked that because I, Eric and I were just talking, we're involved in a network of scholars that meet in Antwerp every couple of years. And when I was there last year, I gave my talk and this was before, I mean, it was just, I, or it was two years ago, I think, just as Trump was coming to the office before Lopez Obrador. And I was arguing that I thought the Eurocentrism of scholarship on neoliberalism liberalization and urbanization prevented us from seeing the fact that the main problem of kind of uh, segregation, exclusion, problems of, of the urban were owed to illiberalism, not liberalism. So I would say that we are, I'm not, I don't want to be on record saying that I think that Lobos Obrador is illiberal, but I think that, that we have new political arrangements and new ways that are dividing these countries and so we need to be looking at the kind of balance of institutions and rule of law in those new political projects maybe we need to kind of recast our concepts but i think there is a new kind of liminality and shifting that we'll need to kind of examine and whether that is a consequence of some of the problems i'm talking about these competing sovereignties or whether it's going to drive them is still to be seen thank you everybody